You're listening to She Speaks, a Let Her Speak podcast that celebrates women's fearlessness, resiliency, and readiness to change the world. Welcome, friends, to the final episode of season one of the She Speaks podcast. I hope that you've had an opportunity to listen to every episode that we've hosted this season. If not, you definitely need to go back and listen to them all. They're all incredible interviews with some amazing women. But for our last interview, I thought I would bring in a gentleman's perspective. And Travis isn't just any gentleman that I I just asked off the street to come and talk to me about women's issues and, and women's stories. Travis has actually been quietly recording every single episode of our new episodes that we did after the pandemic. So he's had an opportunity to live listen to all of these women share their stories, talking about where they've been, what they're doing right now, and where they're going. So without further ado, we're going to have a conversation with Travis. All right. So, Travis, first, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Travis Tench. Uh, I am the founder of Oak Hill Audio, and I'm also a musician and um, organizer. The, yeah, just all the things, the yeah. little things related to audio and music. Yes. Yeah. Um, And most of you probably don't know this, but um, he's been briefly referenced in a few of the episodes that you would have heard as the the lone male in the room. Um, So Travis is our podcast producer. So he's the reason why everything sounds so good of everything that you just listened to. And I thought for our final episode of this season, of the first season of the She Speaks podcast, that I thought it would be pretty cool since Travis has been in the room of all of these conversations and has also mixed and edited and done all the audio for the ones that I recorded a few years ago to get his perspective on um everything that he learned to hopefully also bring in more guys in you know, allyship and the sensitivity to a lot of the issues that women face that you probably don't hear about because you're a dude. And so we don't always talk about these things when there's guys around, except maybe our partners, but not even that. So, um, and we usually always debrief after these episodes too. So you usually tell me that there's nuggets that you pull out of every single one. So what have been some of the nuggets that you've pulled out? Um... Wow, there's so many nuggets. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's always such a. It feels like such a privilege to like be in in the room in in uh, these conversations where I think, um, the everyone's very open about their their journey and their like struggles and and getting through them and um, and new ones and obstacles and. Um, I, I think overall, like it's uh, that revelation of like that everybody's just working hard on things, and often we get the the sort of public, um, you know, uh, Instagram image of like everything's great and like we're having fun, and you know, not knowing that behind the scenes, is, like you know, they're they're really working hard, and things are uh, uh, sometimes difficult. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's wonderful to hear to to hear that. Um, and yeah, I think there are many, many moments that they've mentioned that they're like, oh yeah, I've been there <laughs> and not, you know, wanting, wanting to like chime in and <laughs> while you're, you're having that conversation and just kind of like logging that in, in my mind. Sometimes I take, I've taken notes on some of the episodes on some of the, the things that people have said to, um, that I found interesting or, mm-hmm. what are, so what are some of the, the ones that you, you wanted to pipe in on or chime in on, um, because you felt like you could, you could really connect with that. Um, there were, I think moments like, for example, when we were 
uh, I say we, when you were interv- <laughs> <laughs> interviewing, I mean, you were there, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, I think of it as we were interviewing, um, when you were interviewing, uh, Sarai and she was talking about, <clears throat> uh, formerly being a teacher and I was like, oh yeah. And it, it, we sort of like, you know, she taught in the U S I taught in Mexico. She's from Mexico. And I was like, oh, we just like swapped places in the world and we're like teachers in, in, you know, respective, uh, different countries. And, uh, and having revelations about the direction that we wanted to go and realizing that, you know, we both wanted to be like creative people. And like in, in those moments, um, I feel like that was one, that was an interesting one. Um, oh, what else? So many, yeah, I think, I think for many, uh, of the guests, I think it's like the moments when they realize they, had to make a change in, in what they were doing or just kind of realizing what it was that they really wanted to be doing and, and really going after it. And, and because so many, and, and most of them, it's, it's a very like non-traditional path, like they're, they're coaches and they're entrepreneurs and, um, and facing doubts of friends and family. And, uh, yeah, I feel like anybody who's done that, uh, has experienced that in some, at some level and it's just great to feel like oh yeah they've been there too and they're they're like thriving and they're doing great and like that is a great motivator to keep doing the things that I love doing and and it's it's creative work and and it's a a mix of like a bunch of different things that come and go and right. <laughs> it's a roller coaster you know yeah <laughs> I think that was somebody's word I don't remember who said that I, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure everybody, if they, if you ask, like, uh, would you describe your life as a roller coaster? I'm pretty sure everybody would say yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, what about, you know, from the perspective of, um, you know, being a guy listening in on some of these conversations that there are some, some experiences that are usually unique to what women go through. Um, depending on like what rooms they're walking into or people or um, doors that they're trying to to get through. Um, have there been any, you know, anything that came up that you maybe didn't realize that that was something that women struggled with or that things that we maybe faced? I know you're a little bit more sensitive to that than I think your, your average guy. Yeah, no, I, <clears throat> I, um, I do think it like brings up a lot of the uh, yeah, I, I, you know, ideas and, and barriers that a, a lot of people face and a lot of the, honestly, like the lack of awareness and the lack of sensitivity of a lot of men who have been in these positions of, of power or of, of, you know, uh, whatever it is, the gatekeepers or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, and just, yeah, and a lot of them not realizing what people go through to 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 get through those, and and um, uh, yeah, I think again, it's like why it always feels like such a uh, privilege to be in the room, and, you know, <laughs> hear these conversations. Yeah. Um. So one thing we were, I'm going to bring it up because we were just talking about it earlier uh, when we were working on some other stuff, but this this book that you're reading right now that's about the social connections um, and the the gender differences between, you know, male relationship development and women relationship development, because that's, you know, that's a huge cornerstone of Let Her Speak is all about relationships and connections and things like that. Um, and, and of course, by no surprise, I get every so often guys commenting on Let Her Speak posts of like, well, why not let him speak? Yeah. 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 Oh, <laughs> um, which is like, yeah, sure. But I mean, this is our space. So, yeah. you know, you can have your own space. But um, let's talk a little bit about that because uh, I just find it fascinating. And it's it's better to have, you know, people from opposing sides talking about what what exactly we were talking about just a little bit ago. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I, um, I think one of the, the big takeaways in this book that um, really talks about just relationships and friendships and how, how they're maintained. And over time that, um, a lot of times, especially with, with men, like their, uh, friendships will deteriorate over time. And why does it happen? And, you know, it looks at a lot of like the 
social norms and things of maybe why men can't, you know, it's a fear of intimacy in the sense of like being, you know, talking freely with one another. And, but so much of it is just the work of like, you make plans and you stick to them and you, you do things together that, um, build your friendships, uh, over time and maintain them. And, uh, one of the big takeaways from the, uh, the author was that realizing that his partner was doing so much of that for their social circles. And, and, um, yeah, we see, we see that in, you know, all over, uh, we see that in, in business, we see that in our friendships, we see that in, um, everywhere. So much work that, um, women are, are doing and, and taking on that's, uh, maybe not, uh, not appreciated in the way that should be, or just taken for granted. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a good, and I feel like I had a, had a decent aware of that or awareness of that. Um, but it was good to kind of have that like affirmed and, um, like, yeah, I should, <laughs> you know, continue to talk about that with, with, uh, my other male friends too, to be like, Hey guys, you gotta, you know, let's maintain our friendships. And it, and it has actually reading that, uh, a few other people have, we, uh, had it as like, a um, uh, a book club book. So we get together more often. It's great. (laughs) You guys are so progressive. Oh yeah. (laughs) It's so nice to hear. (laughs) I don't mean that in like a snarky way. I'm just very, very proud of that. Um, so one thing that you, um, I think I probably talked about in at least one episode or it might've been an aside, but, um, so there's, there's numerous books about this. There's one that came out not too long ago that is written all about the perspective of women in the workplace doing a lot of either thankless work or work that's not related to like promotions or to bonuses or to their actual ways in which their performances are reviewed. And um, it's typically centered around the fact that women are really good at planning things and executing things and developing relationships. So, you know, the, the women are the ones that remember to do the birthday parties, you know, and the women are the ones that coordinate the, you know, dinners amongst teammates or like potlucks or anything like that. Um, you know, so we're expected to be the planners of doing all the things that bring everybody together to actually create a good work environment. And therefore then, um, a lot of times you hear, um, you know, it, if you're in a f- pretty toxic environment, you end up hearing that the guy saying like, oh, well, y- you all are so much better at this than me. So you all should just go do it. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, have uh, do you think and I would love your insight or your opinion on this of because um, there's always this debate of number one, women just need to say no. And so setting those firm boundaries of like, no, I am just as much an important part of this team as anyone else. And I should be doing work that's related to my promotion or looking at holistically the work and the contribution that I bring to this workplace that goes beyond just my performance indicators. Um, and, and other people, you know, and if a woman were to bring this up to a male counterpart and say like, look, you got to do this too. It's not just me that they then will be considered not a team player or that they're bossy or that they're, you know, the B of the office. So how would you perceive as from the guy's perspective of being called out if you weren't doing that kind of stuff? Um, like if I, if I were to, be yeah, on the like, receiving end of yeah, yeah, exactly, saying, exactly. Like, how how could you see a woman being able to even breach that and not be seen as just uh, in a negative light? Yeah, it's such a. It, I feel like it's such a tricky. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky thing, and it, and it a lot of again is like I think um, due to a lot of our social norms of of like you know. Um, a female person who stands up for themselves as like, they're, they're too bossy. And if like a guy does it, then it's like, he's taking control. You know, it's like, it's the same thing. And it's, yeah. Um, there's a great song about that by Taylor Swift, you know, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Good old uh, T Swift. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's 
it's tricky. And, and I think like, but it has to be done. And I, and you know, like any, any, any change, any transformation, um, I think can be a little bit rocky, but it's still, it's so necessary. And I think it's bringing it up and also bringing it up in a sensitive way is definitely something that, um, I think, uh, women generally are better than men at doing. Also, I think just, um, in my experience tend to have better, um, I don't know, emotional intelligence, I guess is the, the term of knowing how to, to, um, navigate difficult conversations and that kind of thing and be sensitive about it. Um, yeah, but I think it's, I think it's necessary to do it in a way that is kind of like, yeah, maybe it's a suggestion to just share some of the load of some of these tasks. And once, once you do anything, I think you realize like, oh, this is actually difficult. <laughs> and, and that's really what it has to be. It has to be like realizing, oh, this is difficult work. This is valuable. And this is helping everyone. And e- either, you know, the, the boss has to take on some of that or, or that has to be shared among, um, more people or has to be valued and compensated or, you know, whatever it is to, to balance things out. Um, but tricky. (laughs) (laughs) Have you run it? So, um, like when you, you spent you know a long time in New York Mm -hmm. and so I know you worked for, um, um, several different organizations or you were a part of several different organizations. So looking back, are there instances where that was a very apparent, separation in some of the workloads that were happening, but, and did you realize and notice that, or has that upon reflection actually now come to the surface that you didn't necessarily recognize at the time? Um, you know, I, I, and I think my, my work experience has been sort of a bit non-traditional and, and, um, always in like small organizations and, um, yeah, for the, I mean, the majority of it, it was, it was one that was a nonprofit that I co-founded and it was like basically three of us and, you know, uh, seasonally other people who's, um, running the farmer's market where I met my wife <laughs> and, uh, you know, farms at a, at a high school and, and programming and stuff. Uh, yeah, I, th- I mean, I think there are, there are moments we realized, you know, when, some people would take on more than, uh, the others and, and burn out because it was a small team and, and just trying to keep a, um, a smaller, you know, an organization afloat. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's more, you know, realizing that now of he- hearing other, other people's experience, um, just cause, you know, uh, for, better or worse, I'd never really worked in like a kind of typical, um, corporate, uh, uh, organization or, or company. You're kind of fortunate. I have to say Your personal <laughs> opinion, <clears throat> personal opinion. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so the, um, I mean, one thing I am curious about too. So, um, Obviously, most everybody listening probably doesn't know this, but you and my husband are good friends. Mm -hmm. And um, my husband comes from a very male dominated space of science. And so he has tons of stories of very, very apparent bias against um, a a, a female counterpart to him or, or someone who is equally on the same level as him and the research that they're doing and the tasks that they're doing. Um, and it was extremely uh, explicit that he was getting more of the credit and a little bit more of like the the praise than the, the woman was. Um, and it was much easier for him to break into different areas of science, to be well respected, to be trusted, to, you know, get these projects. And I, I'm just imagining, though, since you're in the music industry, that, I mean, music industry is also rife with bias and sure. with a lot of difficulties. And there's, of course, horrible stories. I mean, T-Swift has her own her own terrible yeah. story <laughs> yeah. with, with her experience in the music industry. But um, being in that space, I mean, have, have you you know, notice that or if, you know, the majority since you're, I I mean, you're not necessarily at like T Swift level, Mm -hmm. but, 
Um, but I I was just wondering at, you know, the, the spaces that you perform in and the groups that you're a part of and the areas of the country that you've lived in, you know, have you have you experienced that or seen that happen? Um, hmm. I'd say not too explicitly on the, on the, um, in a lot of the work that, that, that I'm doing. I, it definitely does exist. And I, of course, everybody, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I guess not, not as much. I do, I do see a lot of effort to, really try to balance things out and try to try to be as, you know, especially among, among the artists that are in that, uh, part of the equation. But I, yeah, I definitely, you know, do see a lot of, you know, in terms of, um, booking or promotion or whatever, you know, opportunities. Um, it's, uh, not necessarily, well, yeah, not necessarily male dominated, but it is, um, very much just like who you know, you know, and just somebody knows somebody and they put your name in that kind of thing. Uh, it's interesting, but yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the decisions are made by, um, older men and, you know, there's that, that bias of, of, you know, who they go to or who trust or, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, what about like pay or any, I don't know if you all like share each other, what each other get for different gigs and, and things like that. We try to do, you know, with the, um, with the, the things that I organize and that the people that I work with, we try to, we try to do everything pretty equally, you know, and just like account for, you know, if we take on any like expenses or whatever, or extra work or something, we try to account for that, but pretty much just split everything equally. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, Again, it, it's it's my <laughs> microcosm of experience, but it's it's also like I think from a philosophy that I really try to think about um, how to how to create a thriving artistic community because that means I can be part of it, you know. And and if it, it is thriving and I'm involved, that means like I will also thrive as an artist. And like that's way more fun, uh, you know. I, I don't want it to. I don't. I think the idea of being competitive and there are, you know, artistic communities that are a lot more competitive. And I think a lot of it's, you know, due to pressures and costs and, um, like New York, you heard of it? Yeah. So <laughs> it's a little, a little competitive. Um, it would, yeah, it's a little more difficult. Um, I, I hear that a bit about, uh, with Nashville too, is, you know, mm -hmm. it's a little more saturated. Um, but yeah, here, fortunately, uh, we're able to have a different vibe and a lot of us that, uh, meet on a regular basis and try to try to like maintain that, that sort of, um, yeah, commu you know, community or I'm fumbling for the words here. Yeah. Um, and just asking the question, like how, like, how can I help? Like, what are you, what are you doing and what are you, what are you struggling with? And like, how can I help? And that, I think that question is, uh, essential and, do you think it's it's been a little easier to create that I'll call it like an ecosystem of of creatives that's a little bit more has more equality to it has more um, di diversity and inclusion that's a part of it and and the leaders are a little bit more intentional and and sensitive to the fact that they need to ensure that all of the voices are being pulled into it um, Do you think that's because you know, you live in a, a little bit smaller community that, I mean, even though we have the cradle of country music in, in Knoxville, it's not necessarily, it's definitely not Nashville, certainly not New York City, not LA, not Chicago, not Atlanta. Um, so it's a, do you think it's a little, it's been a little bit easier to come into a community that you didn't necessarily grow up in to um, be able to impact, I guess, the culture of the community and of the support system of creatives? Sure. Yeah. I think, I think being, uh, being here has been like, I don't know, it seems, it feels like a really exciting time to be here in, in Knoxville. Like, um, I think the amount of like really talented, uh, and interesting people, um, that want to work together and like just the opportunities and, um, yeah, like the, that this ecosystem, the environment I think is, uh, is a much easier one to work in and, yeah. And it's, 
I feel like it's been uh, much easier for me to to really come in and be helpful and <laughs> do fun things and the uh, you know be doing the 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 you know the work that I want to be doing and doing the creative things that I want to be doing and mm-hmm. um and getting paid most of the time to do it which is great <laughs> <laughs> that's always helpful yeah, yeah yeah it's wonderful yeah 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 um so I I would just like to understand more since um I mean obviously uh I would say ego plays a huge, huge um, piece in the types of communities that are very harsh, that have a lot of inherent bias built into them. You know, the people who are making the decisions, the glass ceilings that exist for a lot of different communities, the lack of um, uh, bringing other outside voices in and things like that, um, that... uh, you know, as long as I've known you, you, that, that ego doesn't seem to be a big part of a detriment for, you know, it's like you're, you're, you are more willing to take your ego out of the equation and make it more about the community. Like you said, if everybody's thriving, then I can thrive as a part of that community too. It's not a me versus them situation, which can be, especially in the artistic space can definitely be a big part of it. Um, and ego of course plays a big part of that. So like, how did, have you just always been like that or was it like, intentionally, you know, as you've grown up and, and, um, been all across the world and had these different experiences, have you become a little bit more sensitive to those things? Yeah. Um, that's a complicated question. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, a lot of it was, uh, that I spent most of my life in uh, New York city and, um, yeah, there's just, everything's a little bit more difficult. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful place. I loved it. Uh, I, I do love it. And, uh, but yeah, if, uh, especially, um, for artists, I think it's, it's a difficult place to kind of make things work. And I think that those pressures, uh, you know, can bring out some of the less desirable traits of, of artists and, you know, an ego and competition and, um, so I, I think just being in part of that for a long time and seeing a lot of the bad parts of it. And then also fortunately finding some like wonderful people and wonderful organizations and like groups and like, um, that I've able to travel with and, and, you know, play around the world and, and, uh, and some like theater groups and, uh, yeah, just all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, you know, I got to see both sides of that and see like what, what is great and what works and then like what is um makes me feel gross that I don't don't want to be part of and I don't want to like uh encourage and just kind of having you know I've been here in Knoxville for just over three years now and uh seeing that like oh great this is there's there's so many opportunities and so many creatives and like um so there is the opportunity to, to help and to also help myself as an artist. And, and yeah, like I said, yeah, like, like I said, and like you, um, noted again, yeah, just that philosophy of like trying to help create a, a thriving community is like, it just seems like the right philosophy to me, but yeah, maybe it came with like coming here and, and, and really finally I've always had another, um, very different day job and now it's very much related to to music and creative work so just that uh opportunity that ability to do that is 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 wonderful and i feel really grateful and so i I feel like it's it's only right to you know like share that when i can Mm -hmm. yeah um that's great i like that yeah that's awesome um the so one of the things I'm going to change gears a little bit, um, going back to all of the stories that that we've heard and um, all the women that have been speaking, um, have there been nuggets of um, like things for you to try or um, new ways for you to approach different situations as it relates to 
um, you know, helping out women or being an ally or speaking up because, I mean, studies obviously show that, um, there, there's a ton of studies out there that talk about the fact that um, for a lot of change to happen around equality, around um, it, women's issues, women's health, um, access to resources, things like that, the trajectory of women's careers and women's businesses, that a lot of it um, it ha- it requires that there's more good men, you know, and and not the quote unquote, but actually good people that are speaking up in the rooms where maybe they're not present or being mindful of like, what is being said and how it's being said and the decisions that are being made and the fact of like, oh, wait a second, this is this is great for us guys, but this is terrible for everybody else. Um, so have there been, you know, some of those nuggets or some of those um, inward self um, reflections that have come out of listening to these stories? Um, I've had a lot of reflections (laughs) in listening. (laughs) Um, I mean, I mentioning that of like being the one to speak up when there are no women in the room. I've, it it does bring up a, a memory of like a past job before I moved here where it was, um, a startup and, um, it was all dudes <laughs> as, as they often are. And just asking that question of like, like, why haven't, why haven't you hired any women for this? And they're just like, I don't know. I, you know, it was just like, there was no, no thought of like, uh, you know, finding other, um, people to work anyway. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, as far as um, like major revelations, um, I don't know. I'm sort of fumbling here. <laughs> it's hard. To, I, um, yeah, remembering back to um, each of the conversations, yeah, keeping keeping things straight. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have a good answer. For that. <laughs> Might have to cut that Maybe you'll out. have to yeah, yeah. come back and then you record yourself and answer yeah. and just act like that's the answer that you just gave me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like there's, well, here, so maybe I can spark your memory of some of the stories that were shared. So, um, uh, so we had, Stories of um, women talking about, um, like Berta, for example, talking about um, the increasing feeling of insignificance that's thrusted upon women when they reach a certain age and they get over that. You know, usually it's around like 45 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, so talking about like, you know, men are still widely a part of their careers. They're still working and they're celebrated for that versus women. They're, you know, people forget about women when they get over over that that hill as as you could say um you know there's uh some women that have talked about um the the struggles of relationships and and husband and wife dynamics and and things like that of being the one to speak up if there's an issue and being the one that says it first uh or um there's uh ones that have talked about um having to be the superhero and having to wear all the hats and be all of the things as the woman in the home. So whether that's being the mom and the caretaker and the one that takes care of the house and the one that also is a part of the, um, the breadwinner and, and things like that. So there's been, you know, a lot of those types of, of conversations. So if any, have any kind of hit, hit you as you're looking back on that? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think again, just like having an awareness and like appreciation for like the, the, the work that women do and, and, and really the, like this, the struggle with the sort of modern shift in, in dynamics too, that like, um, you know, there, there obviously are, are many more women that are entrepreneurs and they're like, um, or maybe in the past weren't, maybe we're just working in the home or, you know, it's a, that sort of, uh, traditional dynamic. 
but are maybe still <laughs> expected to do the, <laughs> the things in the home and like, and do all of it and juggle all of those things. Um, it just, that seems, uh, like, a a bit of a unfair <laughs> d- and dynamic of like, you know, take care of like the career and be the breadwinner and then also take care of the house and the kids and, <laughs> you know, do and the pets and or whatever else is there and, and maintain the relationships with your relatives and your friends and do all the social things. Um, and, and yeah, definitely, uh, and then get realizing how, how much work goes into just like making life happen and, and happy and, uh, having an appreciation for that. Um, yeah, it's important work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you, I know you're pretty, you're, I mean, you and, and your wife are pretty actively split between the work that you each do, like around, mm-hmm. you know, all the extra things that you, that you both do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't know if you became even more hyper aware of like all of the things she was doing versus like all the things that you're doing. And if you like had a quick gut check of like, am I contributing to this relationship as much as my wife is contributing to this relationship? Relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, um, fortunately we'll, we'll just kind of check in on those things every now and again. We'll just like have a deliberate conversation and be like, how do you feel? Do you feel like we're, you know, am I taking on enough of, of this? And do you feel like you're doing too much of this? And, and, um, fortunately I think we usually come to a good balance of it. And, um, you know, often there, <laughs> we, we have times where she's like, you know, I know you do like when something breaks on the house or you take care of the car or whatever, it's like, I'm so glad you do that. I know, I know that's like traditionally like, you know, the guy takes care of, <laughs> fixes the things. Uh, and she's like, I'm glad like, that's, that's cool. We can keep that <laughs> in the traditional way. And I'll, I'll, you know, plan the trip to see our family or whatever. Um, so yeah, I feel like we'll, we'll have trade-offs in those things, but as long, I think as long as we're aware of it and we're like deliberate about it and, um, and just appreciated, appreciative of it. I think that it makes it, you know, makes it work. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I also, you know, try to be deliberate about taking on like preemptively, you know, take on the, um, the work of like planning or like social things or Mm -hmm. things that might not be, um, you know, I might not have been aware of before that she was doing more of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you, so the other question I have too is just, um, is this all stuff that you both um, naturally came to or like, are there books or podcasts or articles or things that you've read that have helped you to increasingly, you know, just be aware of things and to be self-aware and to be mindful of what, you know, someone else is doing and how that's, how, what you're doing is impacting them and the ego and like all of these things that are, um, not necessarily always common stories that you hear about the dynamics between men and women or, um, some of the issues that come up, you know, like we've talked about or can be very much tied to ego and, um, you know, toxic masculinity is, is, you know, primarily the, the umbrella that all of those things are, are fall underneath. Um, like, have you, have you had to like, you know, read or do a lot of work yourself to, I mean, I'm assuming that you were surrounded by toxic masculinity at like some points in life. I sure. feel like that's just it's a everywhere. part. Yeah. It's everywhere. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, I can understand, though, that it can sometimes be difficult to be a non-toxic person when it's all around you. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I do think also, it, fortunately, sometimes uh, I feel like in my case, like being being faced with a lot of that. I've like gone the opposite direction because, oh, this is like this is toxic and <laughs> it's terrible. So uh, trying to figure out what the other side is, um, yeah, I, you know, I feel like, um, it would have been helpful maybe more to, or just to speed things along about our communication, like early on, if we had like read books or, you know, but, um, fortunately I think we were, we were deliberate about that of just like having conversations and sitting down and, um, but I think things that have, we've talked about and that have, have helped, um, are like 
one just kind of like doing some of the like, uh, you know, personality tests to see like how, how we are in relationships or how we are, what kind of worker we are, what's important to us. Um, you know, the kind of Enneagram types Mm -hmm. things and also like what, you know, the, what, you know, house you would be in, in Hogwarts and that kind of thing. (laughs) This is the really important, (laughs) the really important, I mean, what house are you? I mean, uh, uh, Gryffindor, obviously. Yeah. I don't, I've, I've oh, never, okay. I've never actually read Harry Potter. Oh, That's not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> also having read, I just read all the Harry Potters. Actually, Lily and I did them, we read them together. Right, um, right. You would, you would read them out loud to each other when you made dinner, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We still do that. It's a daily nice. thing. Yeah. We, nice. we always have a series of books that we're <laughs> reading through. Um, yeah, I guess also thinking about like, things like the the love languages also has been a helpful one for us like um in in both like our communication with one another and uh but also like with our families too realizing like uh say like you know my parents are you know much more like gifts and services and they they that's what they really like to do and like to receive and um and yeah just knowing what what ours are and what's important to us and like that Lily likes to really likes to hear she's done a good job. I should tell her every time if she's done something well, she, you know, re- really appreciates that and needs to hear that. Um, and not that I like give her a gift when she, <laughs> when she, you know, or whatever. Uh, yeah, I feel like that, that kind of thing, those, those little learnings are just about like how we process things, um, differently is, is important. And, and also realizing and sort of accepting, um, uh, maybe sometimes I'm a, I'm a little bit like, I think I'm just being straightforward and I'm like being a little bit robotic and Lily's like, you know, you saw <laughs> when you say, when you say this like this, it sounds like you're, you're being sarcastic. I'm like, what? Really? Like, <laughs> I was just saying, I like this, you know, whatever <laughs> in a, in a, apparently a robotic way. So it, those have been, uh, good learnings about my, um, uh, emotional intelligence and fortunately hers is really high. So mm-hmm. <laughs> by yes, proxy, I would I've, definitely say <laughs> <yeah>. hers is. <laughs> I've gotten better. Yeah. <laughs> so what's, well, you talked about what Lily's love language is. So then what's your love language? Um, I forgot what they all are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, uh, I th- like, I don't know. Pr- I think I like praise too. And like affection and quality time. That was one of the big ones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember. All. There's like seven, right? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember what they all are. It was like, yeah, I think it's like two or three, but uh, quality time is a big one. And yeah, definitely aff- affection, praise. I like, I like all those. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, really, I mean, all of them are great. So it's not yeah. like, I also like gifts and I like when people do things for me. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that none on the list are things that anyone, well, I think praise can sometimes be something that some people are just adamantly do not praise me, you know, yeah. in, in public, yeah. at least they would rather it be like behind the scenes and yeah. they just don't want the spotlight type of stuff. But I think, yeah. I mean, I don't know too many people who don't like gifts. That's, yeah. 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 Sure. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm guessing they're out there, but yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and I guess I also realize I I will often like with us, I would like do something, you know, and it, so it was like gifts and service was like one that I would communicate in, uh, with to her. And it was more important to have like quality time and praise instead of me, you know, not taking care of something for her or something. I mean, she, she obviously still appreciates all of those things. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was just like learning how to balance those a little bit better. Yeah. Cool. And just, again, just awareness. Yeah. Information's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you ever run into, you know, if you, um, talk about that openly with some, of, um, some other guy friends of them, um, also being like, oh man, that's really cool. I want to do that too. Or do you, do you ever get the reactions of like, well, that's, that's weird. Why are you, that's, that's mushy gushy stuff. Why are you talking about that? Yeah. Um, it's, I feel like it's never quite on, on either extreme of that, but there definitely is like, uh, like a, a level of like, you know, talking directly about things like that, uh, especially about 
relationships and um yeah i think the it's more of like when when things go in that direction like somebody just makes a joke you know there's some mm-hmm, and that's mm-hmm. that's always yeah. the uh reaction and then it can take the conversation in different different directions very quickly um but yeah it's i I feel like there isn't there isn't quite as much uh fortunately quite as much like pushback on that and you know and i've fortunately had good conversations with with people and they want to know more and 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 we'll we'll talk about it but yeah there's always i feel like it's also in in larger groups or something it's often uh much more of the like like oh we're just having a good time you know yeah we're not gonna talk about our communication with our wives (laughs) or whatever uh but you know, um, they're generally, generally open to it. Um, maybe it's cause I hang out with artists. And- I was going to say, it's, you're probably, your, your friend group's probably a little biased more towards the sensitivity and, fe- and feeling your feelings type yeah. of things than, um, like scientists. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I could talk with them about, um, being a little bit robotic. Um, That's very true. Yeah, oh, could, yes, absolutely. The roboticness is, is alive yeah. and well in the yeah. STEM world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so, uh, one of the, um, the other things that I, um, wanted to talk to you about is, um, you know, as a, what would be some of the recommendations or, um, things that you would, you know, ask other guys that maybe uh, decided to listen to this podcast. Cause maybe they're number either like a wife or partner or somebody told them that they should listen to it. Um, or they're just awesome supporters and they're very progressive and they're very, they want to be better and do better and, and be, um, an ally. I, what would, what would you hope that that some guys do after listening to this first season of the podcast? Well, um, I would say definitely having um, deliberate conversations with their partners about, uh, you know, whether or not they're you know, hold up their end, their end of things with it, whether it's, you know, the, the balance of, um, responsibilities or the, um, yeah, the sort of planning and, and organizing, organizing and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah. And also maybe talking about their, like seeking out what their love languages are and how to, how to navigate that better and how to, how to improve those and, um, maintaining their, friendships being deliberate about that um that's definitely a big a big thing like i think socially in the in the you know in the larger um the larger realm is that it's yeah it's a thing that happens where people just kind of lose touch over time and and um it's too bad and a lot of like men end up like alone Mm -hmm. when they when they get old and that's and that's sad there's so many sad. wonderful people in the world. Yeah. We should be friends. I know. Yeah. I know. We were, uh, that was one thing I didn't bring up was uh, talking about the, um, at least at, at one point there was very strong statistics that showed that if the wife passed away first, that the husband, it was more likely that he would follow relatively shortly after, uh, especially because the woman was the holder of the social calendar essentially and then when she passes away that gets lost and so unfortunately there's a lot of men that don't really have anybody to talk to or to really bond with anymore um but vice versa if the husband dies first the wife usually can carry on for quite a long time um from uh, you know barring any other medical issues that pop pop up because she has most of the time the social circle that's required so which is really really sad yeah it's sad Yeah. yeah And not not realizing how necessary that is, and yeah, I think that that concept of or not concept, but like the <clears throat> knowing, like you know, we can't always just rely on our partner for everything, and like our our social circles are really important, and and maintaining them is super important, and especially as we get older, and like you know, it's easier, like when I don't know, when you're in school or whatever, you have more free time, more energy. <laughs> and, you know, as you get older and you like get into your career or and maybe a family and other, you know, other things, 
yeah, it's it's it takes being just deliberate about it, mm-hmm. and that's and that's really important, and, mm-hmm. and uh, can just kind of slowly like slip away, and it just yeah, kind of. Got to keep up with it. I do feel like to some degree, I, I don't necessarily know if there's data that supports this, but to some degree, there's a uh, a harsher judgment against women who don't have a social group versus men who don't have a social sure. group. Sure. Yeah. The yeah. like, like cat lady kind of like that yeah, ter- exactly. those terms of like, yeah. oh, she lives the by herself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like throughout history. Right? Yeah. 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 And, and I, I mean, it's still a part of our language that we use on a daily basis to, yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, so Although predominantly like it, it, statistically the, there are much more men that live alone in, yeah. in the world by themselves, like right. because of this, exactly that thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I do truly believe too, that that's why there's so much angry, it just, anger, whether it's online or, you know, in terrible incidents that happen in cities with like shootings and other forms of violence that it's predominantly men that are alone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yes. So we, you guys need friends. You need friends really bad. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge factor in mental health. I mean, more than, more than anything. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and fortunately though, I, I um, have <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I feel like I've seen a little bit more um, that there are people out there that are men out there that are like kind of creating support groups and like you know it's sort of it's sort of like a coaching model, mm-hmm. but it's really that to like coach men to be be friends and do things <laughs> together and and it it's a uh, it's great. I, I'm glad to, I'm glad to see that. And I, th- yeah. I really think it's like becoming, it's coming out of, you know, because it's, it's an issue because it's a problem. Um, but I definitely see that on the rise there, like, yeah, a few friends that I know that like lead groups like that, which is cool. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, from a, a woman's perspective, I can see like a lot of us being like, really, you guys need to be coached on how to be friends. But I'm so glad that that exists because yeah, it, it yeah. does seem like it's just society and culturally it's not integrated into the fabric of expectations versus with, you know, women were expected to like get along with everybody and yeah. to be the menders and be the bridge builders and, yeah. and all of that. So it's just kind of forced upon us to know. And and I, I do think to some degree, too, there's just an intrinsic piece of us that we're, we're just kind of born to be that type of human. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great. I'm glad that those, we need more of those things. Yeah, we need I fewer agree. angry men. That would be really nice. I agree with yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, thanks, Travis, for um, number one, being being my friend, but then also for being our podcast producer and for also um, most of you don't know this either, but the music that you hear at the beginning and end is also um, completely composed by Travis. So he um, took on the task of creating music for me when I wasn't quite sure what kind of music I wanted. But we got there. We yeah. figured that out. Yeah. Um, so that was awesome. Uh, so Travis is, uh, I mean, number one, he's hes a, a great person. He's a great ally. Um, but also he's a really good producer. So if you all need like audio help, you can, how, how, how do people find you, Travis? Um, first, thank you for saying <laughs> all those things. And then thank you for being my friend mm-hmm. and for um, inviting me to... Um, do some of this fun work. I mean, really, we should thank Lily because it was because of Lily that, it's you true. know. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's true. She introduced us. Yes. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's true. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I, uh, to get in touch with me, um, uh, Oak Hill Audio is my company. So it's oakhillaudio.com or Travis at oakhillaudio.com. Um, also, if you like music, I have a band called Tinka Tinka. Uh, just tinkatinkamusic.com or just on all the socials or all the streaming places. Uh, or if you're in Knoxville, you know, you find me around town. I lead some things. A band plays and then we do a live band karaoke a few times a month, uh, host a songwriter night. Uh, I co-organize the uh, Make Music Knoxville. We do stuff on the solstices. I think that's it. And I do <clears throat> live sound here and there. Right, for yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Last thing, so this is going to close it out, is because um, you uh, you tell a lame joke at each of your shows <laughs> that's related to one of your your songs because it has the lame joke in the song. Yeah. So let let's have a dad joke moment. Let's tell let's tell the lame joke. You uh, that one? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Unless you have another lame joke that I haven't heard yet. I have a whole book of them. You know, I've <laughs> I've written a joke book called "101 and One Ocelot Jokes," the book. I don't think I knew that. Oh uh, yeah, it's it's on the bookshelf somewhere. Yeah, <clears throat> it's okay. literally a book of uh, 101 uh, terrible dad jokes, and they're all related to um, the ocelot. The ocelot. Because I thought it was funny. I think I think from like watching Monty Python when mm-hmm. I was a kid. Yeah. And I was like, there I was like, and ocelots, That's and I was weird. like, oh, it's a funny animal, I guess. I just, <laughs> I don't know. It's like I, narwhal, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I like internalized <laughs> that at some point. And then as a joke, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm the author of, you know, 101 Ocelot Jokes, the book. I, like, wrote that on a bio somewhere. And then somebody called me out. And they're like, tell me a joke. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so then I wrote the book as a joke. There you go. Okay. Well, what's, what, let's have your favorite one then. Okay. Uh, um, why do ocelots have such good teeth? Uh, because they floss a lot. A lot of those, a lot of puns, yeah, a lot yeah. of knock knock jokes. Uh huh. Um, uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any? Can people like buy that on Amazon or something? <laughs> uh, not not on Amazon, but it's just on on the internet. Um, uh, with, with blurb, it's like a publishing mm, mm-hmm. company. Yep. Um, and it's soon to I'm soon to put out the second edition. So if anybody, uh, if this airs in time to um, solicit new reviews, if they happen to be you know, one of the people who has read the book or heard that joke and loved it, mm-hmm. um, and putting it out because, uh, with a new, uh, golden seal on, on the front that says, um, the world's best selling ocelot joke book in the world. Cause it's true. <laughs> it's we've, true. Yeah. It's I've, true. I've sold dozens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Nobody, nobody's beat you yet. That, yeah. That's, that's yeah. right. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. <laughs> That's what happens. Well, fun fact about Travis. Yeah. And, and now you all have a great new ocelot joke that you didn't even know that you needed in your joke library. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Travis. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Yep. Yeah. So that's it for season one of the She Speaks podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in, following along. I hope that these stories have resonated with you, have made you laugh, have made you cry. In the episode that you just heard with Travis and I, I really wanted to emphasize that listening to women's stories is not just for women, but it's really for everybody. The better that we can gain perspective of what it feels like to be a woman in our country, to be a woman who has grown up in a lot of different highs and lows of rights, of equality, of equity, and to understand at least or at least empathize with what a lot of us have gone through and what a lot of us are going through. Previous to this episode with Travis, you heard from three other women, Drusella, Berta, and Shannon. Each one of these women, I have the greatest amount of inspiration for, and I look up to immensely. I should say inspiration from, but, uh, and each one of them has evolved so much since I met them. They have found new ways of bringing their passions and bringing their skills and their experiences to an audience that greatly needs them. And I love that story of how women are able to reinvent themselves, to not adhere to what society says a woman should be and to the definitions that are placed upon us and the archetypes that are placed upon us, but to be themselves and to fully embrace that. Drosella, who has been a leader Uh, She was originally a refugee that came from Rwanda, came to the United States seeking asylum, has evolved into an amazing leader and a diversity advocate, and 
is doing so many amazing things in our community. Shannon had started originally, and we talked about this a little bit, as a part of a multi-level marketing company and has since evolved into her own business, working with couples in their relationships and also continuing to support and motivate more women to embrace their own sexuality and to advocate for sexual health. And lastly, Berta, who is just the firecracker that I think every single one of us needs in our lives, a woman who is not slowing down anytime soon, who has evolved, reinvented herself time and time again, and has really helped set and define what it means to be a woman that most likely in a lot of societies would be considered on her way out or on her way to retirement or should not be heard from anymore, should not be seen anymore, should just disappear into the ether. And she is a part of that amazing generation of women that are not okay with that and are not accepting of what has for so long been something that has just been assumed that women should become when they get later in life, to be quiet, to disappear, to not be seen anymore, to not be celebrated for their beauty and for their experience and for their skills. And they have so much to give and they're, they have no sign of stopping. And I am so excited that you got to hear Berta's story as well. All three women and and really every woman in this season one of the podcast are all doing incredible things, are all representative of so many different aspects of life, different perspectives of life, different areas of the country, different areas of the world that they've all come from, grown up through. And I think it's just a beautiful representation of how every woman's story is different And yet so many of us can connect with each other based off of a lot of our experiences. So thank you for being here. I can't wait to share with you when we head into season two. Um, We're going to take on a new topic in season two, so I won't announce too much about that right now. But I hope that you continue to follow along with us and you continue to remember that you have a voice and you have a story with sharing. Thank you. This episode of She Speaks is brought to you by our amazing partners at First Horizon Bank. She Speaks is produced, edited, and scored by the very talented Travis Tench at Oak Hill Audio. If you loved the episode you just heard and want to support Let Her Speak's mission of elevating real women's stories, don't forget to follow, subscribe, and share at Let Her Speak USA. Together, we will make our voices heard.